Welcome back to Judgment Decision Making. I'm Dr. Padilla. Now we're going to cover emotional pain and mirror neurons. When it comes to empathy, all neurobiological roads pass through the anterior cingulate cortex. It's highlighted here, sort of this part of the brain. And this is an important component because it relates to pain and pain perception. I'm going to show you a short video that does a nice job describing some of the components of the ACC and how it relates to physical pain and social pain. So about a decade ago, Naomi Eisenberger and I set out to test whether social pain is more than just a metaphor. And we asked people to lay in uh, an MRI scanner, so we were taking pictures of their brain, while they played what they thought was a um, simple ball tossing game with two other people that they thought were also in scanners. And if you were in the game, you'd control this little hand at the bottom of the screen. And whenever the ball came to you, you would simply press a button to decide who the ball was going to go to next. Really boring stuff. Not a very exciting game. But then something interesting happens. Uh, the other two players who were actually controlling stopped throwing you the ball forever. You never get the ball again for the rest of the game. And, uh, and what we found was sort of two things that we thought were pretty fascinating when we looked at the brains of these individuals. So uh, when we looked and looked at what was going on when these folks were being rejected, we saw that the same brain regions that register the distress of physical pain, how much you're sort of bothered by some physical pain experience, were also more active when people were left out of the game compared to when they had been included. Moreover, the more an individual told us they felt bad about being left out of the game, so the more social distress they experienced, the more uh, these responses were sort of amplified in those particular individuals. And if that doesn't persuade you that social pain is real pain, and I know it won't for all of you, consider this. Uh, what we in the U.S. call Tylenol, what you call paracetamol here, makes these effects go away. So you can give people paracetamol, and it will actually make these social pain effects go away in terms of people's experience and also in terms of the neural responses that we see. So the same painkiller that you take for your headache can help with your heartache as well. And I think this leads, I think, pretty clearly to the conclusion that social pain is real pain. So it's not that a broken heart is the same as a broken leg, but we also don't think a stomach ache is the same as arthritis. There's different kinds of pain. We think of lots of different kinds of pain. And I think that this data suggests that social pain should be awarded membership in the pain club. I think that lecture did a very nice job of describing the importance of ACC in terms of individuals' pain, both physical and emotional. Now we're gonna talk about how those same processes relate to understanding someone else's pain. And first we have to talk a little bit about oxytocin. We've discussed before, but it promotes bonding and affiliation behaviors such as trust and generosity. One really interesting study with prairie bulls observed that they exhibited consoling behaviors towards their stress partner, and this effect depended on oxytocin. What they were able to do is to demonstrate that oxytocin works in the ACC specifically. So when you're blocking out oxytocin in the ACC, then the prairie bulls stop exhibiting that behavior. So that's suggesting that that part of the brain that is telling us about pain is also giving us information about others' pain, but only when we have some type of uh, familial or love relationship when we're with the person that we're trying to understand the pain of. So how do we go from ACC as this outpost of self-interest, monitoring your pain and whether you're getting what you think you deserve, to ACC allowing you to feel the pain of others? And this was proposed throughout the entire book. How much is empathy actually about yourself and how much is, of it is about feeling something towards someone else altruistically? And what the proposition is, is that ACC is essential for learning fear and conditional avoidance by observation alone. Meaning that when ACC is playing a role, what it's actually doing is allowing you to observe pain and feel pain of someone that you care about in order to learn. 
you learn faster when you don't just get this abstract concept of pain, but you get an actual emotional feeling of pain. And that will lead you to avoid that behavior more so than if you learn about it abstractly. And that only works for, um, or mostly works for individuals that are related to you rather than other individuals. That's the general proposition here. Okay, let's look at how some cognitive components also relate into this. And we have a stronger uh, sensory-motor response in our hands when the hands that we're seeing being poked by needles of our own race. I didn't describe this in that much detail, but there's research that suggests when you're shown a video of someone getting poked by a needle, you have a pain response. And that pain response is going to be greater if the hand in the video matches your own race. And it's stronger if you have stronger in-group affiliations towards that particular race. So the greater connection you have to the race of the hand, the stronger the effect will be. In line with this distinction, taking the perspective of a loved one activates the pain association with the ACC, and doing the same for a stranger actually activates a different part of the brain, which is associated with the theory of mind. The ACC gives us this kind of immediate um, relationship with pain to a family member, but if we have to do the same activity, imagine the pain of someone that is uh, very distant from us, we actually have to use a more evolved part of the brain, which has a workload associated with it. So we have to work hard to imagine the perspective of someone else and imagine what their pain is like. It's not this automatic um, um, kind of emotional response as it would be with a family member or loved one. And that relates to this concept of cognitive load. Because you have to actively try to imagine the pain of someone else, if you're under cognitive load ever, if you're stressed or hungry, tired, anything like that, it is harder for you to take that perspective. And so this suggests that we are more likely to help a family member if we're under stress than strangers. And finally, it pertains to this concept of empathy fatigue. If you're constantly having to work hard to imagine someone else's perspective, imagine their pain, you're eventually, you will eventually tire out your um, cognitive system. And there's certain people who are very distant from the rest of the world, like the super rich. Rich individuals um, have a smaller social group and it, they're very distant from the vast majority of the people, particularly people that are in pain from things like the impact of global warming. So they have to actively try always to imagine the perspective of other individuals, which is why they tend to have less of ability to feel the pain or be empathetic towards people because they always have to actively do it um, uh, in a difficult way in their mind. It's not automatic for them. Okay, I wanted to save some time to talk about mirror neurons. This is very short billing for this groundbreaking development in cognitive psychology and behavioral science, but I'll play this short video clip for you to get a sense of it. Let me take you back to the early 1990s, sleepy little laboratory in Parma, Italy, and scientists had a MRI brain scanning machine on a macaque monkey as the macaque monkey was trying to open up a nut. They wanted to see how the neurons would light up. So the monkey's trying to open up the nut, the neurons light up, and just by serendipity, and this is how science sometimes happens, a human being walked into the laboratory, I don't know if it was by mistake, and he was hungry, he saw the nuts and opened up one of the nuts and tried to crack it open. The macaque monkey was totally shocked because who was this invader in his laboratory? And he didn't move, he just gazed at this human trying to open up the nut, just like he had done a few seconds earlier, and then the scientist looked on the MRI brain scanner, the same exact neurons were lighting up when he observed the human being opening the nut as when the monkey opened the nut. And the scientists had not a clue as to what this was. They thought the MRI machine had broken. They then began to put MRI brain scanning machines on other primates, especially chimpanzees with our big, big neocortex. Then they went to humans. And what they found over and over again is something called mirror neurons. And that is that we are apparently soft-wired, some of the primates, all humans. We suspect elephants. We're not sure about dolphins and dogs. We've just begun. But all humans are soft-wired with mirror neurons so that if I'm observing you, your anger, your frustration, your sense of rejection, your joy, whatever it is, 
And I, I can feel what you're doing. The same neurons will light up in me as if I'm having that experience myself. Now, this isn't all that unusual. We know if a spider goes up someone's arm and I'm observing it going up your arm, I'm going to get a creepy feeling. We take this for granted, but we are actually soft-wired to actually experience another's plight as if we are experiencing ourselves. But mirror neurons are just the beginning of a whole range of research going on in neuropsychology and brain research and in child development that suggests that we are actually soft-wired not for aggression and violence and self-interest and utilitarianism, that we are actually soft-wired for sociability, attachment, as John Bowlby might have said, affection, companionship, and that the first drive is the drive to actually belong. It's an empathic drive. Mirror neurons are very exciting. So this suggests that in addition to this activation of ACC and your ability to actively work in perspective take, there's neurons in your brain that fire when you observe someone doing something in the same way as if you would be doing it yourself. So there's lots of ways in which we are hardwired to try at least to empathize with other individuals. Now, emotional stress evokes the same response as physical pain. We learned that in the earlier part of this talk. This is likely due to advantages of learning. That's potentially one of the reasons why we've developed mirror neurons is also for learning. Also due in part, of course, to mirror neurons. And mirror neurons um, are neurons that fire both when an animal acts and when an animal observes the same action being performed by another.